All right, here we go. Well, welcome to the Akkad and Coca Report. Um, today we, we have the honor of having uh, Jeannie Lenzer here. Jeannie Lenzer is uh, an award-winning uh, medical investigative journalist and author uh, of a recent book, uh, her first book, I understand, The Danger Within Us, America's Untested, Unregulated Medical, uh, medical Device Industry and One Man's Battle to Survive It. And she, in this book, she talks a lot about um, uh, 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 the intersection of money uh, with medicine. Uh, she discusses um, how profit-seeking may distort medical science, maybe undermine public health. Um, and she discusses. Uh, she also talks a lot about hidden financial ties between industry and public uh, public institutions, including the FDA, the CDC, the NIH. Um, Jeannie is uh, incredibly prolific. Um, she writes for. Uh, an, envi an enviable elite uh, group of folks. She uh, used to write, or still writes. I still uh, do. I'm actually still an associate editor at the BMJ. At the BMJ, and also write uh, at the. Also have written for the Atlantic, the New York Times, Washington Monthly, uh, Mother Jones, Huffington Post. The list goes on and on. So, Jeannie, welcome, welcome, and it's an absolute pleasure to to have you on. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So you've, you know, I just wanted to start off talking, just having you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey. I understand that you started out as a um, physician assistant. Right. That's right. Yeah. And um, that where, experience. Uh -huh. So where, where was that? Where did you, uh, where did you start? Where were you in the United well, States? I went, yeah. I went to Duke University for my training and uh, practiced in North Carolina for a while and then uh, moved to New York. And I worked in both family practice and emergency medicine for years. And um, I think like everybody, you know, you come across certain things that sort of separate from what is um, received wisdom. And uh, eventually I was, I actually sort of um, in a backwards manner bumped into a real scandal and that became my first investigative piece. I'd written a few clinical pieces before that, but my first real investigative piece had to do with TPA for stroke. And um, because that was published first in Mother Jones and then in the BMJ, um, I became known internationally for that kind of work and, and subsequently doctors um, from all over the world would contact me with these kinds of stories and that's how i i learned about some of this ah interesting so it was uh it was those experiences it was that one particular experience that you chose right up now did you have a, 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 a journal i mean some type of journalist training or were you, were you just somebody who no i was just writing? mad as hell <laughs> i was just mad <laughs> I when see. i learned you know the first story was when i found out that the american heart association received uh, 11 million dollars from genentech before they made uh, TPA for stroke a class one recommendation. And I was never, you know, people accuse me of being obsessed with the, the financial conflict of interest issue, but I'm only interested if and when it interferes with the actual science. And I was really glad that you presented it the way you did about, you know, that I'm interested in the intersection between science and, and money. Um, it's not that money every time distorts, but it's when it does that it, it really concerns me. And the issue of TPA stroke was strongly contested by a lot of emergency physicians. Yeah, yeah. And, and you certainly, you do spend some time talking about the, the genesis of that and stuff, which is very interesting about a lot of stuff in the book that I actually didn't, didn't know about uh, at all. Um, but um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna hit a lot of these uh, when talking about uh, uh, your book. And you 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 set the book around um, uh, one individual, actually, correct? Um, yes. A patient who uh, had a, uh, a pretty tough COVID. He had a brain injury as a child. Um, at uh, at some point, he as an adult, he started having seizures. Um, he failed medications. Um, and he went and sought, uh, 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 you know, tertiary type care, uh, as is often done, for uh, brain surgery. Uh, you know, they they take out, as you wrote, uh, they take out the they try to take out the epileptic focus if they can map it to one place. He was deemed not a candidate for that, and now with refractory seizures, that was fairly disabling. You would agree, Jeannie? Yes. He, yeah. He then, yeah. You know, uh, went down the path of having a. Um, a vagal nerve stimulator placed. Um, now, so, uh, so just for anyone in the audience who doesn't know what a vagal nerve uh, stimulator is, a vagal nerve stimulator 
is uh, essentially a, a battery that's hooked up to uh, a wire and the wire is wrapped around your, uh, the vagus nerve in the neck. The vagus nerve is a, uh, is a large bundle, is a large nerve uh, um, that uh, uh, innervates the brain. I mean, it goes from the brain to the body and, and essentially this is a way of stimulating the vagus nerve in an attempt to try to retard uh, seizures or reduce the frequency of seizures. That's the general uh, concept. So your book focuses a lot on, uh, folks is, you know, is, 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 uh, focuses on the device industry. And so I was wondering if you could maybe lay the groundwork and tell us um, a little bit about the device industry and specifically the current state of regulatory affairs, meaning, you know, if you want to, if you have a device and you want to take it to market, uh, what, what exactly, what regulations, uh, uh, what are the hurdles that need to be passed uh, to, to get to market? Sure. Well, the reason I used um, this key patient, Dennis Fagan, to thread throughout mm -hmm. the book was because he takes us right through the process of how right. a device is uh, developed, approved, monitored or not monitored, sold, marketed, and um, ultimately how even a Supreme Court ruling, lobbying, and other issues impact devices in general. And I just right. use him as an example. And then right. I almost like a clothesline, hang off a number of other uh, devices and how the same thing happens right. to other patients. And when Dennis brought his story to me, um, I, I had mostly focused on drugs. I really knew nothing about devices. So I was not only shocked when I got his medical records, um, which I requested right away because I wasn't sure if his story was one to report or not, um, but when I got his medical records, it was pretty stunning. Um, and I actually wanted to publish um, his EKGs, but the editors decided uh, not to not to do that. But they're, they're really impressive. I mean, he just flatlines and it's not flatlining for, you know, a few seconds. Right. This is right. <laughs> like you're dead. No. Yeah. And, and it happened every single time the device fired. Um, right. So um, I had a look into how how did this device get on the market? How are devices approved? Or right. in in FDA lingo, it's not called approval for the vast majority of devices. For over ninety five percent of devices, including implanted devices, they get onto the market through a process called clearance. And clearance, well, I shouldn't say ninety five percent. I'm going to back up on that, but the vast majority of devices do not go through what they call their stringent high-risk pathway. They go through instead this 510K pathway. But I wanna back up, even before the 510K pathway, and I'll explain that a little bit. The problem with devices is um, that in 1976, that was the year that FDA took um, regulatory control over devices. Until that point, devices simply weren't regulated. There was no regulatory authority. But by 1976, there were already a lot of devices on the market. I mean, there were pacemakers, there were artificial knees and hips, um, there were cataract lens implants, there were all kinds of devices, implanted devices on the market. So what the FDA said was, okay, anybody who's already on the market, you can just stay on the market. We are grandfathering you all in. That was in 1976. Okay, so what happens with any device after 1976? Well, they created this 510K pathway. And that pathway can be used um, by a device manufacturer to say, gee, there's a device already on the market and I've just developed one that's pretty much just like that device. And you get 510K'd in. You don't have to do clinical trials. Um, in, uh, and I would say, Virtually 100% of cases, they do not do clinical trials for 510Ks. Um, instead, it's based on a, the notion of a predicate device. If there's a device that's a predicate that's already on the market, you can get on the market. Now, not only is that has that allowed almost um, a telephone game type situation or whisper down the lane, we used to call it, where what starts out as a hamburger ends up as a cantaloupe. I mean, there's no connection as it goes through iteration after iteration after iteration of predicate upon the predicate. And that situation is so bad that they even approved, or again, the word would be cleared, they even cleared surgical mesh based on a predicate that had been removed from the market as dangerous. And when I called the FDA up and said, how can you clear this device to go on the market 
when they're citing a predicate that's been removed because of safety issues. And the FDA's answer to me, and I have it in writing, is we don't judge the predicate device when we clear a device. We only judge that there is a predicate. This is how loose the regulation is. Now let's get to their so-called PMA or pre-market approval process, which is used for high-risk devices. Well, as is, this, is that part of the so underneath within the 510C that this is then the PMA is, is, is that? No, it's, it's, no, it's separate. 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 So 510K, okay. there's three classes of device. Right. Right. Class one and two, or I'm sorry, class three is the lowest level. And those right. devices are, you know, things like uh, thermometers or, right. you know, a scalpel. Right. Right. Um, class two devices include things like um, artificial knees and hips um, and a number of other implanted devices that, um, and it turns out that these lower level, these so-called lower and moderate risk devices actually comprise the vast majority, 86% of the, and here I, I'm going to have to use the class one nomenclature, which is different when it comes to risk. That means it's the highest level of risk, risk that is highly probable to cause serious adverse events or death. So these lower ones are getting on the market, even though they're the most likely to cause deaths and serious adverse events, just because they're so numerous. Then you get to the class three device. I'm sorry, the class one. I'm all confused. Um, the high risk devices that go through the PMA process. And the PMA process, the pre market approval, they say is their very stringent process. The problem is that there's a loophole there. The PMA process, yes, they may require some clinical tests, um, but those clinical tests are often ridiculous, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but also, they have a supplement process that's a lot like the the 510K process where what the manufacturer does is say, well, we're only making a slight change to our device and they just approve it. Sometimes approve it through a phone call. That's all it takes. So the supplement process turns out to be the majority of the approval processes at this point. And I'll give you an example of how dangerous that can be. The Sprint Fidelis lead wires which many cardiologists and other people are familiar with, um, where 96,000 of them had to be recalled. What happened is that went through a supplement process where the manufacturer said, oh, we just made a slight change in our wires. They didn't have to clinically test them. That slight change was that they made them thinner. And the problem was is they fractured. And they would shock people when they shouldn't be shocked and fail to shock people when they should. So there's a looseness on, on device regulation. If I thought I was shocked by drug regulation, <laughs> device regulation is, um, well, there's a device expert um, who I contacted when I was writing my book, and I said, oh, you know, the FDA is looking at lowering the bar for approval because they want more innovation for devices. And she said, I don't know how you can lower the bar when it's already in the dirt. <laughs> that's yeah, so, so the conclusion I reached. Right, right. No, no, that clearly is from from the book. Um, so, and and just you know the the story of the VNS stimulator is a nice one for for kind of us us to go through uh, as, as well. So, so 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 as I can as I can get from your so that's a great summary by the way of, of the uh, various different uh, uh, pro, uh, pathways to getting devices approved. Um, but it sounds like from in terms of the VNS stimulator, um, there there's some. Uh, basic issues that you take. One is that uh, uh, right off the bat, the VNS stimulator should not have been approved by the FDA. And it should not have been approved by the FDA um, uh, because the effect size is, um, you know, the effect, the, the trials that were done showed effect sizes that weren't that significant or clinically significant. They used surrogate endpoints. Um, it, it, would that be a fair representation yes. of what you're saying? And in fact, the issue of surrogate endpoints was brought up by a methodologist, the only methodologist that was on the review right. panel. And he pointed out that, um, you know, he said, we're tempted to say fewer seizures means better outcomes. Right. First of all, there, I would argue there weren't fewer seizures, and I can talk about that in detail if that's necessary in terms of right. the numbers and how they ran the trials. But let's just assume that there was some decrease in seizures. Even if there was, the problem is what everybody's concerned about is, is deaths because 
people with epilepsy are more likely to die than people without epilepsy. And they often talk about SUDEP or sudden un unexpected death of epilepsy. So what he pointed out was what we've all talked about with dysrhythmias that, you know, um, and I'm blanking on the name of the study now. I wrote about it in the book. I forget everything I've written. Um, what's the famous study that was done that showed the 3.6 times higher mortality rate with antidysrhythmic? Um, oh, the CAST trial. Right, right, right. The CAST, CAST yeah. trial. Exactly. Right. And he said, right. you know, here you've got a surrogate marker where we think that if you have fewer seizures, maybe you're less likely to, to yeah. die. He said, but there's a very high rate of deaths among the test subjects. Sure. He said, should we be concerned about that? Now, that very high rate of deaths was so concerning that they only approved the device conditionally. And yet no patient I have ever contacted or who has contacted me has ever said they were notified that the device was approved only conditionally because of this concern about a high rate of deaths. I think that ought to be a requirement. If you're going to put something on the market when you're concerned, I mean, first of all, they should have sent the company back to clinical trials if they were concerned right. about a high rate of deaths instead of putting that on the patients. So, 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 two, so two, two questions. One is, one has to do with, so all surrogates are not necessarily equal, correct? Meaning, meaning it's certainly the case. So just a little tiny bit of my background. I'm a cardiologist. Uh -huh. I uh, happen to work very, very closely with a very large uh, neurosurgery group um, in the, in, in Philadelphia, which is a pretty big area. So, uh, um, so it, certainly I've seen a tremendous number of patients um, who just have horrendous, the uh, uh, who, or quality of life is just miserable because they have so many seizures. Right. Um, right. So, uh, so I think, and I, and I think I'm, and I've spoken to, and in, in my, I've spoken to a number of different different epileptologists and neurosurgeons uh -huh. and stuff. And certainly, it, it seems to me that the drive for them is that they're being pushed, not being pushed, but I mean, we're doctors. We're asked by patients all the time, "Please make me right. feel better. Please right. make me live longer." In this case, I'm not so clear that you know the patients that are suffering. Again, these are refractory epilep uh, epileptics, meaning they've gone through one, right. two, three. They're on three drugs. They're still having right. multiple seizures. So it doesn't seem to me, Jeannie, that um, that ridiculous of, of a thing to, um, to say, hey, I have a device that I think can reduce uh, the burden of seizures. Um, and whether it ultimately results in lower deaths or not, uh, you know, who knows? I, now, I think, um, I think the, the gr very great, the great point that, you, that, you, that that's brought up in the book is this idea that that you know, if you reduce number of seizures, will you have a reduction in the number of SUDEP? SUDEP for the folks that are listening is uh, sudden death in epilepsy, which is believed to be uh, is believed to happen because of you know severe convulsive epilepsy. The mechanisms of it are somewhat unclear, but uh, but uh, regardless, whether that link exists or not, it doesn't seem to be that link exists. It seems a reasonable you know, if you're bringing this device to market to reduce seizures to give back give people back some certain quality of life, it's not an unreasonable thing if you can, if you can have that as an endpoint. Do you think that's that, was that that egregious on their part? That, uh, yes, I think there's two things. One is desperation isn't an excuse for bad science. Right. And yes, they are desperate, but we've got right. to be honest with the public about what we really can offer. And, and, sure. and in this instance, um, I think you're right to point out that if people are desperate and maybe they want to take a risk that, that they might have a slight increase in mortality um, and be willing to do that if they had a decrease in seizures. But it right. doesn't look like either case was true. And in fact, there was a suggestion of a higher rate of deaths than perhaps in right. a non-surgerized so uh, uh, population. But that was the big flaw with their study. And it's a, a flaw that Rita Redberg has pointed out and others have pointed out over and over that if we don't have sham trials mm -hmm. for surgery, we really don't know the right. answer. Right. So, here, so, so here are the problem with, uh, you know, so the, the, there were five trials, I believe, that was done. Um, they numbered them nice and easy, easy for us, uh, the e, E01 to E05. Correct. Um, EO, uh, EO3 and EO5 are the ones that, are, uh, that you bring up in your, in your book. Boy, did you, you do your homework? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, the, and, and the two trials were uh, randomized control trials. Uh, I think they uh, were approximately 100 patients in EO3, about 200 patients in EO5. And they looked at, it was a 12-week study, 
And you're right. They didn't have a, sh- a sham. They didn't well, they have had a, sh- a supposed sham. Yes. But they and- didn't have a medical control. Right. They did not have a medical control. Correct. So, 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 but, but again, the thought process was for the, for, you know, the, certainly for the investigators, the thought process was that we are going to have a, a sham where we have, everyone is going to get implanted with the device. And one group, we're going to have the device turned on at a very, very low rate uh, and a frequency that's much lower. And the other group is the therapeutic uh, uh, group where you have a high rate. And in that particular, so, and the reasons for that, as I understand, was that the patients would be aware if they never had the VNS turned on. Does that make sense? Right. So, so yes, if they didn't have the VNS turned on, then it's... The design. I, right. I, I actually complemented right. that part right. of the design. Right. So, so in that, so, the, so in, in that comparator group, you know, I think in both the O3 and O5, you had when you look at the percentage of folks that had a less, a greater than 50% reduction in seizures, this is just at 12 weeks. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the numbers, as you point out, this is from your, from your book, as you point out, the numbers are about 30% in the high dose and in the sham group, about 14%. Uh, and in the same, the, approximately the same amount in the EO, EO5 trial as well. So it, it appears to be that, you know, about, you know, that, that, that there, there certainly are some folks that have a significant percentage of reduction in terms of their seizures. And then of course, in the FDA panel, you always have, you know, the folks that come in with anecdotes that are, you know, the hyper, if you, you know, this is David Brown will get very upset if I say this, but the super responders, the folks that really respond really well and say that, you know what, I mean, before this, I couldn't walk out of my house and now I'm able to walk around and do okay. But, well, but in, in the trial, I mean, just in terms of the, you're talking about the quality of evidence. Um, uh, is it, is it, is it unreasonable to come away looking at the data to, to, to say that, all right, there certainly seem to be, this, isn't, this is not a cure, nobody gets cured, but, but it certainly seems to be a certain group of people that may respond. Uh, no, I don't think you can draw that conclusion. You can't, okay. No, absolutely not. You've got, okay. you've got two comparator groups. By mm-hmm. chance alone, one of them was likely to be better than the other. By pure chance, they weren't going to be exactly equal. Um, but when you subtract the difference between uh, the uh, low uh, um, low dose group from the high dose group, right. and then that only looked at the number of people who achieved a 50% or greater reduction. Now, first of all, just time alone meant that some people, you know, that were going the regression to the mean, we're going to get better. Right. But we also had. So that's why you do RC, that's why you do RCTs. You do RCTs that are supposed to deal with the regression amine, correct? But wait, that's true. But both. wait a second. Yeah. We don't know if that was any better than medical treatment, or if it was worse than medical treatment. And I'll tell you about a study in a minute. Another RCT right. that finally did use a medical comparison trial, because what happened in the meantime, of course, was that drugs changed in the meantime. Right. I mean. Ephraim came on the market and all right. sorts of things. Right. They used historic controls in other studies, not this one, but in other studies, to claim benefit. Those were moot. They, 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 you can't do that. You know you can't do that. So for this RCT, we have one RCT, and not only the difference between the two groups lost any statistical significance, but they didn't subtract the people who got worse. And about a quarter to a third of the people had more seizures. In fact, some people had more than 600% more seizures. So there really was no net benefit. You could say, yes, we could squeeze the balloon in the middle. Some people got better. Some people got worse. But you don't know who those people are. And you're implanting a device that appears to have caused really serious harms in people. I think without another RCT that had a medical control arm, Right. Could you really trust this? Yeah, this is, and this is where you know. I think it's, I think it's, uh, yeah, and I think it's hard, Jeannie, because I, I think everyone is. Uh, well, I mean, I think there are a lot of people in this space. There's certainly some bad actors uh, in, in, in all in all of this, but there's certainly there's a large number of folks that are trying to, you know, that are dealing. The, the fundamental problem that they're dealing with is you have folks that are having. I mean, just like Mr. Fagan, right? Uh, he was uh-huh. having. I mean, he was having disabling seizures, and so. Whenever you're talking about having a medical arm, 
you know, this is like the, we have this discussion all the time in, in medicine and various different things. So it, uh -huh. it's very similar, meaning you have folks that have reached the end of their rope, meaning right. they have failed all medical therapies, right? So for a clinician like me, you know, when I see that, when I see that, well, now you don't have another medical arm, right? It's like, well, I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't, to me, that, that's not like, that isn't like, well, automatically this is baloney and it, it doesn't matter because you've already had folks that have failed. I'll give you a small, tiny little example and we'll, we'll move on. But uh -huh. when you had, um, you know, when you have, uh, I, I wrote about this uh, 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 in the liver transplant uh, uh, community uh, when Prograph came out. Um, one of the, you know, it, it, was, it was a similar thing here where you had folks that were, uh, that had failed uh, mm -hmm. uh, or that were failing and they were rescued with, with the newest immunotherapy that was out there, in this case, FK506. Uh -huh. um, okay. And it was the same type of criticism from folks saying, well, you know, the, it's a surrogate endpoint. Uh, you know, these people are being rescued and therefore the uh, surrogate endpoints can change. Um, oh, sorry, the, the surrogates, you know, the, the, the overall uh, organ failure didn't change because these folks were rescued with FK506. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, when you're dealing with folks that are at the end of the rope and they can't, they don't have any other options, um, you can certainly add a third, a third medical arm and continue watching these folks. Um, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know how un, unreasonable it may be to, um, you know, to do... To, 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 not, to not have a medical arm. Uh, not to say, I'm sure there may be more trials that are- I think are, it's unethical. I mean, have, have you read Vinay Prasad's um, uh, Ending Medical Reversal? I have, I've, I've read it, I've, I've read it All cover right. to cover. So how many times have we had to turn our backs on medicine that, you know, was bad? I mean, we're yeah. wasting people's lives, their time, and we're not being honest. I mean, if we'd yeah. been honest with patients about the VNS device, we would have mm -hmm. said, there's a study that leaves us concerned about a high rate of deaths. You may have more seizures. You may have less seizures with this device. Do you want to try it? That's fair if you want to do it that way, but that's right. not what anybody did. Right, right. And more than that, why waste everybody's time and money? I mean, everybody's hell bent yeah. now on accepting a single RCT. And we know that a single RCT isn't good enough. It has to be reproduced. And it has to be reproduced in a good way. And, and nobody will do that anymore. Nowadays, right. one RCT is it. And that's crazy. Right, right. No, no. I mean, yeah, of course, as you know, I mean, it's not like, you know, how many RCTs have we had on chronic stable angina? Is the controversy any less than that we had 12 <laughs> RCTs on, on management of stable angina? I, so, I mean, look, I, look, I think you're, you're absolutely, I'm not, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's certainly, I, I'll just say that it's certainly, you know, if you t certainly talking to the neurology, uh, ep uh, the epilepsy community, I get the sense, and and if you look at the the uptake in terms of VNS, right, right when VNS came out, and by the oh. way, I I loved your story of the uh, the swashbuckling uh, uh, Houston CEO. Uh, what was his name? Oh, Skip, what was his name? I Skip, forgot. Skip yeah. Cummings and uh, Skip Cummings, yeah. And uh, oh and the story, God. right? Uh, anyway, and so um, the uh, where I lost my I lost my thread for a second, but no, I said people when, in the epileptology right, community. Right when VNS when VNS uh, VNS came out, it was clear there's a there's a large uptake. Um, and uh -huh. but then if you see, I think if you look at the if you look at how often uh, VNS is now used in 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 in, in, in certainly in 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 most places that know what they're doing, it, it's it's used as a kind of a agent of of, of last resort to say that we have nothing else to try. You're miserable. We can try this. There's a chance that you may, and I don't know exactly what conversation is happening in place. There's a chance that you may get, you may get uh, uh, better, but there's a chance that, you know, you may not get better. But it, it certainly seems to me that the community of neurologists, right, has mm -hmm. recognized the fact that VNS uh, stimulators are not hugely efficacious, right? Which is why they go through like 12 different things before they finally get to that. Uh, I'll tell you that in talking to, uh, I, I, I called up one of the, one of the surgeons who is, is I think the biggest implanter and, 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 and where we are in Philadelphia, which is not uh -huh. small. And he says, you know, he said he did 12 all of last year, right? Uh -huh. So, uh, so I, I, you know, the FDA, we had this debate earlier about the FDA and what role it plays in terms of deciding safety versus de deciding efficacy and deciding efficacy is a much much harder lift than saying okay this is safe but but you know it certainly seems like the 
the the the uh, uh, neurology community is listening to what what you're what folks like you are saying right or uh, is reading the data to be what it is which is look this isn't a super efficacious thing and we use it as a last resort and there aren't that many vns uh, uh, stimulators being uh, uh, being placed well i hope it slows down and i right. gotta say one thing that deeply disturbs me is mm -hmm. i i treat um developmentally disabled patients, mm -hmm. and they virtually all have VNS devices in them if they have seizures. And that's extremely disturbing. I mean, one of the women I talk about in the book right. um, experienced horrible shock, shock so right. painful it knocked her to her knees right. um, from her VNS device. And right. um, she called her sister and said, you know, I don't know what to do. It was a Friday night, and her sister said, go to the ER. And right. she's like, can't the doctors right. in the ER don't know how to deal with this? Yeah. So she lands up um, being found dead in her uh, mm. bathroom yeah. uh, by her young daughter. She was in her thirties. Right. Now, one of the problems is these mentally de uh, developmentally delayed patients. Many of them can't speak. They can't let you know if it's causing them pain. Right. I saw one patient who was having chronic hiccups, a known effect of the device, right. and it had been going on for a year. Right. And I could not convince the implanting doctor that this could be a side effect of the device. So I just feel so bad for all these young children and developmentally disabled patients who are being implanted yeah. with something that's potentially deadly. Yeah. So this, it's a perfect segue into the next part. So I, you know, that, that whole point was trying to talk about the efficacy and, and, and kind of the, the con I mean, you feel obviously strongly that it's, the efficacy stuff is, 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 isn't at all uh, Proven. proven it may be right. someday but i'm not <laughs> i'm not convinced right right the and, and i think you know if you t any neurologist worth the salt who i've talked to it says it says it doesn't isn't as strong as what you're saying they say look there are some patients that we see you know these are people that have treated thousands and thousands of folks and you know they monitor folks in epilepsy monitoring units where they can see how much seizures are happening and they say look in some patients it's you know there, there's some efficacy that's reported it's never a cure and um, you know whatever they, 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 no one no no i have yet to talk to a neurologist that says this is amazing and we should put everyone yeah, in everyone yeah but yeah. so what it gets to, but the next point is i think is even more important the, the, the question that you bring up in terms of the uh, adverse uh, effects of the vns right so yeah so specifically with mr F uh, fagan that you discuss in the book um, he was having seizures before and after the vagal nerve stimulator went in, he was, he started having more episodes where he would just collapse and yeah. some of those episodes he would collapse and he, and I think he broke his wrist and, and yes. himself. And we went to the ER, uh, what he, what he found was, what they found was pretty profound where every three seconds on the telemetry three monitor, minutes. sorry, every three minutes on the telemetry monitor his he would, his, 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 he essentially would become asystolic. His heart would stop beating. Um, and that, that of course was timed with the every three minute VNS uh, stimulation that was taking place, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so and, and obviously in his particular case, it seems rel relatively clear, even without the EKGs that I, that I kind of wish you had put up there, <laughs> yeah. that his, the VNS in this case was stimulating the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is, you know, when you stimulate the vagus nerve, you can certainly, it does. every cardiologist knows you can get bradycardia and uh, asystole perhaps. And in this case, in his case, he was doing it. But here's the thing, um, Jeannie, when, you know, in the trial, in the, the trials are very small, of course, right? So it's, it's hard. You, you right. Brought you up can't the, pick everything up in a trial. Right. Right. But, but it's not, but it's not that, you know, of the, if, if, if VNS stimulators were as, um, were causing as many adverse events as, as, you know, as is being suggested by Mr. Fagan and as is suggested by some of your anecdotes um, that you brought up in the book, um, why aren't why didn't why didn't we see you know eighty percent of those folks having significant events? You know what I mean. Meaning, it exactly. would seem to me that the, yeah. the the percentage of folks that and this is by the way, and then you know what I mean. I I talked and again I talked to a, a couple of epileptologists and they they say look I could, on the efficacy front you know you know it's it's you know it's there's a we think at most there's a small level of efficacy, but on the adverse event fronts you know everyone I talked to was pretty clear that. Look, we just don't we don't see severe adverse events. So when I asked them about you know bradycardia and asystole, and by the way, uh, it, you know because I'm like the usually the first call for this very large <laughs> this large neurosurgery group. Normally uh -huh. every every single call of you know skip bead or bradycardia or asystole, I'll I'll get a call. I've been doing this since 2010. Uh -huh. I, have, I have not I have not ever had a case of uh, you know a, a patient with a VNS. Uh, causing, you know, bradycardia or asystole. I mean, it, it's clearly 
it, it happened. Mm-hmm. It's clearly happened. It clearly happened to Mr. Fagan. But uh-huh. yeah. you know, my impression is, is that it's, it's an incredibly rare event. When I also spoke to one of the neurosurgeons who implants mm-hmm. the device and said, hey, do you, you know, what, how do you, he says, well, how do you deal with this? He says, number one, you know, we know from the, we know from some of the earlier studies that the right vagus is, is much more, causes much more bradycardia. So we, we right. implant on the left side only. Right. And in the OR, they actually turn on the device. And they look specifically, that's what they're looking for. They're looking specifically for bradycardia, looking for any types of pauses. And if there is bradycardia, which sometimes there is, that means they're too high and they go back in the dissection and they move where where they've wrapped this around the vagus nerve. They move it down so that when they turn it on, they don't see any bradycardia. Um, So it would seem like, you know, um, you know, one of the things, one of the challenges, one of the is, that you bring up is that, you know, we should not be using the five anecdotes of how awesome the device is to say, Hey, we need, we should approve the device by the same token, Jeannie, should we, are we, are are we kind of putting the horse before the the cart? If if we use say the anecdotes that you have for adverse events to kind of generalize and and, and say, Oh my God. Well, I try not to use anecdotes unless I also cushion them in within the context yeah. of statistics. Yeah. And, and, and what I complain about here is that we really don't know. We don't have answers about harms. Um, and, and there were thousands of deaths associated with, pa- with patients who had the VNS device implanted. And given that the average age of implantation in, in test right. subjects was 33, we're talking about a lot of young people dying and these deaths, a number of them, as I go through, and I didn't even put but right. just a few examples to give a taste of what right. hundreds of deaths look like. Right. So we have patients who walk in a room and drop over dead. Right. Well, they didn't have a seizure. Um, was this silent epilepsy that caused uh, SUDEP? Or did they have asystole? Right, right. And we don't know the answer to that. And so that's where I argue that the MAUD database and yeah. FDA's monitoring is really lacking. Yeah. But there are a number of patients who clearly were shocked into asystole. And it's not just Dennis Fagan. I mean, look at that woman who died who was being shocked. She could feel it. And, you know, she wanted yeah. it that had to wait we're, till Monday and Sunday. Night yeah, yeah. But there are many, many others like that in the database. And, right. and also the problem is, Anish, is that, Anish, is that what we see as benefit and what we see as harm, we typically ascribe to exactly what we want it to be. So I'll give you an example. I had a patient who had uh, partial complex seizures, which is what this device is supposed to be used for, and came in with an aide, a nurse, who um, told me that the device was fantastic. It was a miracle. Every time she swiped the patient's VNS, his seizure stopped. And I said, well, tell me this. How long does it take you to recognize that the patient's having a seizure? Well, maybe 10 seconds. I have to look at them to see that something's happening. How long does it take you to get to the patient, to take the magnet off his wrist, and then swipe it? Another few 10 seconds. And how long does it take the seizure to stop after that? Well, maybe 30 seconds to a minute or so, and it goes away. And I said, well, before he had the VNS, how long did his seizures last? Well, maybe one or two minutes. But she thought this was a miracle device because she'd been told that if you swipe it and the seizure stops, it's because of the device. Conversely, Dennis Fagan himself thought that he was having seizures. His neurologist thought he was having seizures. Nobody knew what was wrong until he went to the ER and they actually caught it. How many patients died before they got to the ER? He was a strong, healthy firefighter who had a good heart. Well, right, but things just died when that happened. Right, right. But, but Jeannie, the, the same, just like you're putting this together, um, you know, there's a, there's a super smart <laughs> neurology epilepsy person who's also trying to look at all this data and trying to put it together. So I'll tell you that, you know, I mean, they, they have these epilepsy monitoring units, right? We have, you know, there's one right. the local hospital and the patients stay in the hospital for sometimes five, 10, seven, eight, or whatever uh, number of days where they're hooked up to an EEG continuously. There's a video on there and they also have a single telemetry lead, right? Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. and so, you know, in terms of, you know, these patients, and it's a known, it's it's been a known risk factor for some time, even before VNS came out, right? Sudep, uh-huh. where patients uh-huh. right, with right, severe right. seizures suddenly yeah. die. Yeah. And again, the thinking among both uh, among among the neurology community, based on, I think, data from the EMU, where these folks are all monitored, right? When somebody uh-huh. walks in and dies, you know, how do you know what happened? Was it 
the right. criteria that started I don't, first. Yeah. But, but I'll tell you that in talking to them and pushing them to say, hey, could SUDEP be a primary cardiac dysrhythmia, right? Um, one of the leading experts on SUDEP says, look, there's certainly, it's multifactorial. There's certain, we found channelopathies where, you know, there's, uh -huh. they, they share something in common with a cardiac dysrhythmia and maybe right. in those group of people or something on. But she says the vast majority of SUDEP that, the, that, they've, that, that, that they've been able to capture and see in patients that have been in the EMU takes a very temporal pattern where the patients first have flat line, the, person, the patients have a flat line on the EEG, then they will have a, a, a respiratory depression, meaning that they, they become apneic, and, uh -huh. then, and then they become bradycardic, and then they become asystolic, and that's when they die. So, uh -huh. and she's I'll talking just, about that being SUDEP, not from obviously not from the VNS, from SUDEP right, itself. right, exactly. You know, these are patients that may or may not have the VNS in, but you know that wouldn't uh -huh. make sense, right? Why would? How can right. I? Yeah, so, so, so that's. I mean, that's why the neurology community meaning. I understand the, the conclusions you're coming to based on looking at the data, but the reason the neurologists are coming to a different conclusions is because in their, you know, when they're monitoring these folks in the EMUs and they have, they see this progression, right. Um, uh, you know, they think it's, they think that SUDEP is an entity that exists outside of, outside of, uh, you know, outside of. Oh, absolutely. It process. exists. I'm not questioning SUDEP. Right. I'm saying right. that we should get a matched population that has a certain rate of SUDEP and match it against a population that has a VNS. And, right. and I'm not saying that we know for sure that there's right. going to be excess mortality with a VNS device. I think right. it's possible. Right. And I think right. without proper monitoring by FDA, yeah. which we do not have. Yeah. And look at Cyberonics was yeah. found guilty of not reporting 80, more than 80 deaths. Yeah, I mean, no. this is typical of these companies. Yeah, yeah. And it's unfair. It's no, unfair no. to patients. Yeah. No, you, I think that's a, you, you bring up a great point in terms of how we're, we're it's in, what, the way we monitor uh, after procedures go, and meaning if there are complications to, uh, related to a device, it, it's really, really poor. It's voluntary. It's pretty lax unless there's some type of registry or something that's set up. Even yeah, the registry yeah. setup is not great. So I think that's a great, great uh, uh, point that you uh, uh, bring up there. The, I, I, you know, I, the, from the cardiology side of things, um, folks always say, well, you know, we could be, you know, there's always this notion that you could be causing harm with stents, correct? Uh, right. Stents for stable angina. You mentioned Bernard Lown talking about, you know, these devices. Going. But, I, and I, I, but again, I, I never get a good answer to the fact that, well, we have thousands and thousands and thousands, thousands of patients in RCTs, correct? Where you've mm -hmm. had stents versus, versus uh, medical therapy, say, right? Not in a single one of those trials have we seen higher mortality with stents, which is why... Right, but we also didn't see reduced mortality for stable yeah, angina. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's what... That, that's, that's a separate... Yeah, yeah that's a, I think that's a, that's a... Yeah, it's two separate issues. It's a whole different uh, debate. Right. But we, we, you got to show, meaning if, if you're looking at the data that we have and you're making decisions with the data that we have, and you're absolutely right, we need better data and we need better databases and we need better reporting. Um, but if well, we're looking we at mandatory registries, that's for sure. I mean, that's very clear that we, we're not going to get the information without that's that. Sure. And I think that tendency to ascribe negative outcomes mm -hmm. to the underlying disease to suit up in the instance of VNS, rather than to the possibility that our intervention is causing it. I mean, that's something I call cure as cause. And mm -hmm. I wrote about that in um, right. Smithsonian. So right. anybody wants to read about cure as cause, <laughs> It, it, it crosses quite a few um, disciplines. Right. Do you think there's bias on the other side where there's, there's a bias that uh, an, a device may cause harm? For instance, the, you know, by the way, I, I, sh I, should, I, I forgot to mention in my opening monologue that uh, Bleeding Edge is clearly inspired by your, by your book or by your work. Well, I don't know about inspired, but they did say that it helped them. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. So the bleeding edge, the bleeding edge documentary on Netflix, which highlights a number of different devices and how they may have, uh, you know, damaged, uh, oh, they they've affected the life, uh, lives of patients adversely. Um, but you know, the 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 the, the eShore device, uh, for instance, right? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's almost like you get this. Um, it, it, you get stuck in this in this weird place where you all of a sudden you have now that it's spread so far and wide that the eShore can cause a variety of different problems. You have women coming in who've had eShores implanted that have these very nonspecific vague complaints, and it's it becomes hard to uh, it becomes very hard now to describe to, to figure out what exactly is going on. So then you're left with the data that you have, and the data that you have says, all right. Not to talk about eShore, but to talk about you know whatever you have, whether it be stents or whatnot. But it's hard to then ascribe 
harm. So the question is, well, Art, I'll tell you one harm. Art yeah. Sidraki and uh, an OBGYN did a study yeah. of women who had Eshore compared to BTL, and they were 10 times as likely to have to undergo resurgery. Right. So Eshore clearly um, causes more complications than a simpler bilateral um, tubal ligation. Right, 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 right. I guess, I guess there's this, this whole, how do you get beyond the I mean, once you once you spread this far and wide, right? Well, this is the, this is also the danger of social media and everything going going viral and communicating yeah. so quickly, yeah, right? Yeah. Now, any yeah. I mean, any woman who goes onto the Eshore Facebook group site, I mean, if they if they have significant if they have symptoms, uh, like how, like how do you get away from this almost this nocebo uh, effect that you will, right? I mean, it, like you, you know the nocebo effect that you see with yes. statins, yeah. that's that's yeah. clearly well reported, right? I mean, you have people discontinuing, going from statin to placebo, <laughs> and they still have, you know, they still have a significant percentage of, uh, they still complain of muscle pain and whatnot. Oh, um, have you seen but, that? I, I, I'm unaware of that. So there's a study showing that they, the nocebo effect with statins and muscle pain was this. Yeah, yeah with myalgia change? that, you know, the, the percent, the percentages stay, stay very similar to when they were taking a statin. Oh, right? I'd be interested so, in that. But I mean, I agree. I, certainly there are people who contact me and they have all kinds of Right. Bizarre, you know, right. this must have right. caused an immune reaction and now I have lupus and it has yes. nothing to do, of exactly. course, with the exactly right. device that they had put in. It doesn't seem. And, and, and Jeannie, you know, I mean, in that Bleeding Edge documentary, you saw there was that one woman. Yeah. And yeah, I think I, you're referring her, referring even, her. <laughs> I didn't you have know, anything to do with that. I know, I know. But, but you see the problem because that woman yeah. has had so many surgeries, right? And now, and they're all attributed to yeah. Ishar. So it becomes, you almost get into this. Yeah, I, 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 it's just like the. Well, that's why a single with, anecdote is useless. Yes. I'd rather talk about the studies, and that's yes. why I mentioned yes. the study of resurgery, no. right. um, which you know you could say, well, they're just complaining, except right. that those things, um, the inflammation that they cause, and the perforations that they cause, so that those uh, Eshore wires, that, for listeners right. who aren't familiar with it, these are just wires that you stick in the fallopian right. tubes and their right. the intent is is that they cause intense inflammation right. and that inflammation of course allows them to perforate and they right. show pictures of these all yeah. over women you know the perforating the fallopians perforating even the uterus i mean it's right. pretty shocking right. right the kinds of problems that women have with that absolutely yeah do you do you think there's any do you see any downside to regulating the device industry more well, the accusation against me and other people who want to see better regulation, of course, is that it inhibits innovation. But my argument would be the same, you know, as that I said earlier, when we look at all the medical reversals that have cost not only millions of dollars in wasted mm -hmm. effort, but in lawsuits and fines. I mean, I, I, I list the numbers of fines that Medtronic and St. Jude and all these other companies have had to pay over the years and billions of dollars that they just do as the cost of doing business. I'd rather see that spent on um, doing better clinical trials before we put them on the market. Yeah. And then knowing that you can't catch all uh, adverse events through a clinical trial, you know, having mandatory registries and actually yeah. monitoring well afterwards. Yeah. I, it seems to be it seems to be really really hard because you know devices are expen are you know are pretty ex are, are expensive. Um, so it seems like the other thing in terms of um, you know there's of course possibly could you perhaps inhibit the desire for companies to take on that massive expense to do it. But the other thing is um, uh, uh, if they do go through all those steps, correct, mm -hmm. and they do finally get to market after clearing the the the, the Vinay Prasad bar of. <laughs> million strong RCTs, then uh, what, will these, what will these devices cost? Will, will that not bankrupt us, Jeannie? No, I mean, not when you save money. I mean, if we did it as a government, as, as the, if the people really want, if medicine is really something for the people, mm -hmm. then A, we owe it to the people that all adverse events should be reported so people know mm -hmm. the truth about these things. But we also want to have a commitment through NIH to actually fund independent studies. And unfortunately, virtually all NIH, well, I don't know about all, a huge percentage, and I've actually tracked it for a certain period yeah. of years, was by far and away the majority of NIH grants are actually partnered with industry funding, which has had a terrible effect because it means that data from those clinical trials, despite the Sunshine and Data Act, have not been available to the public, to doctors. Right. to reanalyze. So concealment of, of, of negative outcomes is very common. 
and it's common, unfortunately, even with NIH studies. Yeah. So I think if, as, a, as a society, if we really want um, to help the public and public interest, we need to fund that. Yeah, and, that, that'll be, but it'll, yeah, but it'll be, but don't, don't you think that, I mean, whoever does it, don't you think that'll be incredibly expensive to do? I mean, suppose, so take that, take the town, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tower, the Alaskan yeah. orthopedic surgeon yeah. who had the metal on metal hip implants, you know, hip, hip, hip replacements have been, I mean, uh, you would agree one of the more, more successful device implants. Yes. Yeah. Let's people get up out of bed and yeah, returning again. It's fantastic. Right. It's amazing stuff. And, and, uh, some device company came up with metal on metal. Now that the, the, the desire was to get rid of the problem with the, the well the prop the small problem which was which was you know you would need another hip plastic wear and stuff yeah. yeah yeah and and so metal and metal was felt to be you know stronger and oh yeah it, i would have gone for it i right, would right right and it was it marketed sounded good right it sounded good and uh, and unfortunately but again it's it's hard you know when i'm talking when i talk to a bunch of my orthopedic uh, surgery folks they say yeah you know I wish we had known, but uh, you know the, the the percentage of folks that have. I mean, there are a lot of folks with hip on hip, hip, hip uh, metal on metal hip implants that are doing fine. But there's this percentage of folks, and you know, the, the guy I talked to was positing that, you know, it may be that the folks that were going for the metal on metal were the very very active folks, right? And everything wears wear has a has a wear rate to it. And mm-hmm. you know, it's no accident. I think the doctor Tower, you know, he, you know, he he's, has that picture on the bike after he has his metal on metal, oh, yeah. where he's done yeah. like 200 miles. On his yeah. bottom lip, and he feels awesome. So, you you wonder, you know, in order to simulate that type of thing in an in vivo model, like try to think about that. How how would you do that in a sheet? No, I mean model? the point is not that you can find every adverse yeah. event again, but that that was discovered in Europe, not in the United States. Mm-hmm. And the reason was because they had a mandatory registry, and we don't, and we know who tends to report when things are voluntary. I see. So that would be one, one solution, which would be, meaning you can't Absolutely. capture every adverse event, but, right. but you can have a registry. And when this stuff starts coming up, it works. It, uh, we, we do it. And, and whatever we have now, you think is just not, is too haphazard and too slow and folks could be getting harmed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The last, last point, Jeannie, and then I'll let you go. I know you're busy. Um, one other point that's brought up is that, um, or the other, I think, interesting issue in this is devices versus drugs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 coming to pass now that drugs are incredibly expensive, right? So, for instance, an, a new AED that comes on the market could be fifteen, you know, fifteen thousand dollars a year, um, and those new AEDs, um, and you know, the cost of a VNS is say thirty thousand dollars a year. I'm uh, sorry, thirty thousand dollars total. Um, uh, are we? Uh, should we? Should we? Um, there is clearly a bias, um, uh, as you've pointed out, for that, that kind of favors devices, if you will. Should we have, sh- is, that, is that altogether wrong, uh, given how much drugs may cost during their patent lifespan? Well, a couple things. I mean, first of all, people, and I also was guilty of this, just assumed that devices were in some ways safer than drugs. Um, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have all these drug effects, you know? Um, the problem is that there are several things that are very different about devices than drugs. Number one, implanted devices can't just be stopped like a drug can if you have a problem. And sometimes you not only can't stop them like that poor woman who died while she was being so horribly shocked, but you can't even take them out when you want to. So in Dennis's case, the right. lead wire uh, migrated into his uh, jugular vein right. and it, it caused so much inflammation it could, he knows, go right into his carotid. It already has a clot on the end of it and he knows that that could cause his death um, and they won't take it out. Most people with BNS, the, the surgeons will not take out the leads because they're so ensnared in all this fibrotic uh, material. Same thing for some uh, pacemaker lead wires. So, you know, the problem is not being able to stop it as quickly. The second is, is that they have their own set of side effects. Um, and those side effects can be very serious. Everything from, as in the VNS, bradycardia and asystole, to other kinds of problems. The third thing is, is that many devices actually require drugs, not only the drugs the patient was already on. And by the way, when patients got the VNS device, it wasn't that they stopped their anti epileptic right. drugs. They kept taking all those same drugs and they right. added right. on the VNS device. Right. But on top of that, many devices, because as you know, 
about stents or other things, you then start having to take other drugs on top in order to be able to tolerate that device. So, you know, what was your question? <laughs> I was asking whether we should have a bias. Is the bias reasonable towards no, the device? Industry? No, no, no. We should be aware of those problems with devices. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, my take on, I'll, I'll end and you can I'll leave you the last word if you, if you want, but I, I'll end by saying that my, my take on Vinay, you know. Vinay Prasad. Yeah, Vinay Prasad. Vinay. And, yeah, Vinay. Does he pronounce it Vinay or Vinay? He does pronounce it Vinay. And, really? and my oh, other because friend Vinay his... said Vinay, Vinay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I should, I should, I must be because, uh, anyway. So is that I, and also and also to you, is that um, I would favor having a group of doctors and making doctors, having doctors be, uh, be much more critical uh, thinkers uh, than they are right now. I feel like, you know, a lot of, I, th I feel like Vinay and, and, and perhaps you may, be, um, too, may have too much faith in RCTs, have too much faith in evidence-based <laughs> medicine. Because yes, yes, it was a problem to, eminent, eminence-based medicine was absolutely a problem, right? Some, yes. some, some old guy saying this is what right, we do and right. therefore every single person gets uh, flecconide for PVCs, yeah. right? That was, yeah. That's a major problem. But Jeannie, I'll, I'll, I'll say that like, when the RCT for cast came out and, you know, uh -huh. flecconide, fle flecconide ended up increasing mortality, right? I think it's a, the wrong uh, takeaway from that is that we should never use flecconide for patients with, with uh, structural heart disease or CAD. I think, you know, there's studies that have come out recent, you know, recently and as, they, as we knew they would, showing that flecconide is remarkably, remarkably effective at reducing uh, tacky burden and, you know, not just, PV, sorry, re reducing PVC burden and therefore may cause fewer, uh, less progression to a cardiomyopathy or heart failure. So I think both, I think when we take either to extremes, whether it be eminence-based medicine or evidence-based med med medicine to extremes, I, I think we have a problem. So RCTs are fantastic and tell you, tell you or are good and tell you that the average patient should not get this. So, you know, surviving sepsis guideline, you know, the surviving sepsis stuff, it tells you if you, if you take the sepsis guidelines, right? And the sepsis guidelines say we should give every single person six cc's per kg of, I'm forgetting the numbers mm -hmm. now, but some mm -hmm. massive six liters of volume in the first 24 hours, right? And every single person with sepsis, you know, we, as doctors, we stop thinking. Every single person with sepsis who would right. come before right. us, whether they had heart right. failure, an EF of right. 10%, or they were 30 right. with a normal EF, yeah. all of them we would flood with, with volume. And we would all very smartly quote, oh, the surviving sepsis guideline says this, and Rivers, the Rivers trial says this. And, and I think that was, that, was, that was wrong. And I think either way, we, 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 I don't, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, with a world where, where you have doctors that just kind of aren't thinking through and treating the kind of the individual patient in, 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 in front of them. So, um, so uh, you know, but no question, you know. Well, I, I want to comment. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I think, I think you're right. I mean, clearly there are limits to an yeah. RCT and clearly we need reproducibility. Um, and even with reproducibility, there can be problems with RCTs. Um, but I don't think we can just supplant that with case reports and with observational data. And unfortunately, when it comes to devices, I was at an FDA hearing yeah. where industry has made the case. And I kid you not, I've yeah. got this in writing. Um, they actually said this. They want to be able to use post hoc subgroup analyses to get mm. approval of devices. This is how low the bar is now. Yeah. So, yeah, we should have so scientific studies, but we can't. And, and I also want to say there are things where you can look at an individual. Let me give an example. Like with Prozac, I, I was yeah. um, interested in, um, I'm forgetting the name of the Harvard psychiatrist right now who wrote a book, um, jo uh, Joe Glenn, Glenn Mullen. He's a mm -hmm. psychiatrist. And he actually uses Prozac, but he said, you know, um, activation is a real problem and increased suicidal impulses is a real problem with the drug. Yeah. And he said, but I still use it because I tell my patients, look, you may get worse on this. You may get better. If you get worse, tell me and we'll do something. We'll change the drug. We'll reduce yeah. the dose, we'll do whatever. Right. So there you have time and you have opportunity to work with an individual patient right. in an individual way. How does it help them? Right. And, and that's good. But there are other things where if it, the problem is it causes death and you don't know who it's going to affect, the only thing you can do is say, the net result of taking this drug is that you're more likely to die. And in that instance, you know, patients have to 
use informed consent. If they feel more comfortable, you know, not having tachycardia, but knowing that they might be more likely to die, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> I have nothing against that, but we need to be honest about what we know. Right, right. So again, my solution would be to vaccinate the doctors. So I want doctors to be mean because I am constantly, there's a constant barrage of, uh, you know, pharmaceutical stuff that comes, right? The pharmaceutical companies yeah. want, they send salesmen yeah. to you yeah. and the salesmen, their job is to get you to use their product, right? Absolutely. And so, and I, you know, I, I would, I, yeah, I would just, and I, and I think we're on the same page. We, we, we want doctors oh, to yeah. be, uh, to, 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 to think a lot more about uh, what they're doing uh, and, 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 you know, kind of do what's, uh, do what, do what, they think is best for the patient utilizing all the data that they that they have and the better and the more data the more good data that we can get them uh the, the better so but Jeannie, thank you thank you so much thank i hope you <laughs> i hope you it's really I, great talking with you thank you so much yeah yeah thanks again and uh, good luck with everything we'll, we'll hopefully talk again soon too all right <laughs> thanks anish right. bye bye yep bye bye